Indian startups are going global, and for the longest time, all we ever heard about were American and Chinese companies coming to India and eating up market share, or Indian founders going to the United States or Singapore or Dubai and starting their companies there instead of building in India. But today in 2023, things are changing. There are a number of Indian startups that are building in India, but they're building for the rest of the world. And so in today's video, I'm gonna be highlighting 10 of those companies. And the first one that I wanna start off with is Ola. And Ola is a little bit of a cheat here because technically it's actually two companies that are building for the world. One is Ola Cabs and one is Ola Electric. Both of these companies are unicorns and both of them are global. So let's start things off by talking about the first one, Ola Cabs, which started in 2010. It was actually called Ola Trips back then and they were in the business of selling weekend getaways to their customers. But eventually they realized that there was more scope for Ola to become a bigger business if they focused on disrupting the ride hailing space the same way that Uber was doing in the United States. And so today Ola is actually one of India's largest ride hailing service providers. They're present in over 250 cities across India, and they also serve Australia, New Zealand, and the UK markets too. And then we also have Ola's EV business, which is getting all the headlines these days, Ola Electric. And they started that company in 2017. The journey really kicked off though in 2021 when Ola Electric launched their S1 scooters. And by the end of 2022, Ola had sold 1.5 lakh scooters, making them the highest selling electric two-wheeler brand in India. But that wasn't enough for Bhavish Agarwal. And so in September of 2022, Ola Electric announced their plans to go global by entering the Nepal market. And then in November of 2022, they announced that they were expanding to Italy as well. Now, at the moment, these do just seem to be plans. There doesn't seem to be any tangible runs on the board when it comes to Nepal or Italy, but it's definitely something that they want to accomplish in the future. Bhavish has also expressed his desire to enter into the Latin American market, expand across Asia, and also into the EU markets in the next phase too. All right, the next company on this list is LensCard, and it's a pretty obvious global expansion at scale because people around the world have trouble with eyesight. This is a global problem, and LensCard is offering a global solution. So just like Ola, LensCart was started in 2010, and they started off by selling eyewear exclusively online with the vision of making eyewear accessible and affordable to Indians. However, after realizing that the majority of Indians were still shopping offline, LensCart opened their first offline stores in 2014. Since then, LensCart has expanded their offline presence by opening more than 2,000 offline retail stores, selling over 8 million eyewear pieces every single year. Now, the reality is that a majority of LensCart's offline stores are still in India, but a about one fourth of their stores are located outside of the country. So LensCard has a presence in the United States, the UAE and Singapore. But apart from the LensCard brand, last year in 2022, LensCard actually acquired a Japanese eyewear brand, Own Days, in a deal worth $400 million. This gave them access to over 350 Own Days stores and expand their presence into other Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Japan, of course. And so today as a global and yet proudly Indian brand, LensCard Cart is not just dominating India's eyewear market, but also they're the largest eyewear retailer in all of Asia. Moving on to the next startup on this list, we have Bengaluru-based health and fitness company CultFit. And I'm not sure if you're noticing the trend here, but all the companies on this list so far are serving something that all of us as human beings face. And in this case, it's fitness. A lot of us struggle to stay fit and healthy. Of course, CultFit, which started off as CureFit, didn't begin their journey with the goal of helping people around the world to get fit. They just started off focusing on India with an acquisition of another fitness startup called Cult. Now, Cult was a little bit different from your regular gym because they focused on training programs that that didn't use any machines or equipment. Instead, it was this creative mix of martial arts, yoga, and outdoor activities, and this formed the core of what Cult Fit is today. With the acquisition of Cult in April of 2016, the founders of the company decided to scale this model by opening up over 200 centers across the country. However, in 2020, their aggressive growth plans, which were centered around offline expansion, hit a roadblock because of the pandemic. This resulted in them pivoting towards personalized online workout training programs, and this was actually something that they could scale around the world. They started off by expanding into the United States, and then last year in 2022, ColdFit acquired F2 Fun and Fitness India. This gave them access to Gold's Gyms, India business, and now they're planning on expanding and opening up Gold's Gym franchises in countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Maldives, Bhutan, and Nepal. Next up, we have hospitality unicorn Oyo. And again, hospitality, hotels, this has massive global scope, and Oyo definitely took advantage of that. So in 2013, Ritesh Agarwal managed to convince a hotel owner in Gurugram to turn his property into an Oyo hotel. This was his first property, and within a month, Ritesh had managed to take the hotel occupancy up from 20% 
10% to 90%. From then on, Oyo had continued to grow rapidly and reached a peak valuation of $10 billion in 2019. And then they expanded globally in a big way to more than 80 countries, making them the world's third largest hotel chain. Of course, everything came crashing down during the COVID-19 pandemic. They had to lay off thousands of their employees and shut down various business lines across multiple countries just to survive. And their biggest investor, SoftBank, actually cut their valuation from $10 billion down to just $2.7 billion. However, Oyo seems to be making a comeback now. They're improving their revenues, they're controlling their losses, and despite the difficult times that we're currently in, Oyo continues to be a global hotel brand with 157,000 hotels across 35 countries. All right, the next company on this list is a used car marketplace called Cars24. And again, the global potential of selling used cars is massive. So this company was started in 2015, and what they promise customers is that they'll buy their car in just 30 minutes. But the reality is that they don't actually buy the car. Once the inspection of the car is done, they basically put the car on an auction website where their partner dealers bid on the car and it gets sold to them directly in a matter of minutes. This incredibly quick and frictionless process has enabled Cars24 to become a leader in the used car market in India, but also around the world too. Apart from having a presence in over 180 cities and selling more than 250,000 vehicles every single year, Cars24 as of 2021 expanded their global presence starting in the UAE and then Australia and then Thailand, helping them to boost their revenues to 6,072,000 crore rupees in FY22. All right, so the next company on this list is called Vatham Tees, and it's the only Indian brand ever to be featured twice in a row on Oprah Winfrey's list of favorite things. The company was founded by Bala Sarda in 2015, and they had global ambitions from day one. See, the thing that Bala realized is that while India is the second largest tea producer in the world, most of that tea is being produced for the Indian market, and there are actually very few truly global Indian tea brands. And so Bala decided to build a premium tea brand out of India itself, but for the rest of the world. Vadham sources their teas directly from over 100 tea plantations in India within days of harvest, packages them at their facility in India, and then ships them out to their customers around the world. They made 1.5 crore rupees in their first year of business, and 95% of that revenue came from global markets. Today, Vadham tea ships to over 130 countries globally, and these include the United States, Canada, and a number of countries in Europe, and these are actually their biggest markets. The company earned 200 crore rupees in FY22, sending a strong signal to Indian investors that there actually is a huge opportunity for startups to build global brands out of India. Okay, so this next company is an interesting one because they're building emotionally intelligent AI-powered robots for kids around the world. This company is called Miko. So in 2015, three IIT Bombay graduates came across a data point that showed them that the learning level of kids in India was dropping year after year. And this trend was actually similar across other countries as well. From 2009 to 2014, there has been a 50% drop in standard three kids who can do basic subtraction in India. This survey covers millions of kids, and this trend has been consistently observed across multiple subjects, multiple kids of the age of 5 to 10. This trend was also observed in countries outside of India. They decided that this was a problem that they could solve by building educational robots for children. They launched their first product, Miko, in 2016 for the Indian market, and the response was outstanding. And despite the fact that the product was actually priced at 19,000 rupees, Miko was selling really well. They went from selling out this robot in their first three to four stores and then expanded to 300 stores across the country. And so with the success of this first product, they carried on with the Miko 2 in 2018. And with this second iteration, they weren't just building this robot for India, but actually for the global market. And so today, Miko is selling their latest iteration called Miko 3 in India, and also 140 other countries around the world. They already crossed an impressive milestone of $12 million in revenue, that's 100 crore rupees in FY22. And they're looking to get even more ambitious with $100 million for the next financial year, and they're placing their bets on global markets. Moving on to the next company on this list, we have a wearables brand, Goki. So Vishal Gondal started Goki as a fitness wearable company combining personalized coaching services through a mobile app in 2014. And so unlike other wearable companies that just sell you a fitness band and that's it, that's where the journey stops, Goki actually takes things a step further because the fitness band is just the top of the funnel. And actually they have an entire fitness ecosystem where their customers pay for their services. They offer everything from personalized coaching to buying health products and while the company Company did start in India, Goki has expanded their presence to other countries like Singapore, Malaysia, UAE, and the United States. 
See, just like cult fit, Vishal realized early on that helping people to get healthy isn't just an Indian opportunity, but also a global one. And so Goki is the perfect example of a hardware and tech startup building from India for the world. Okay, so this next company is near and dear to my heart and also people in 15 countries around the world apart from India, it's a beer company called Beera 91. And a lot of people don't realize this, but Beera 91 was actually international from day one. So in 2015, when Uncle Jane started Beera 91, they were actually importing beer from Belgium and bottling it in India. However, as demand started trickling in, Uncle decided that he needed to start brewing his own beer in India by setting up his first brewery in Indore in 2016. And even though Beera 91 was just getting started in India, Uncle actually had huge international ambitions for his craft beer brand from day one. So they'd already marked their international debut with the launch at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2016 in New York, making Beer 91 the first Indian craft beer to be sold in the city. In 2017, Ankur claimed that he wanted Beer 91 to be the first global brand from India, and so he launched Beer 91 in five new international markets, London, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Dubai. And in the meantime, by 2020, Beer 91 had already become the fifth biggest beer maker in India with a 2.7% market share. Today, Beer 91 is a presence across 550 cities in 18 countries globally, making 720 crore rupees in the financial year of 2022. And then finally, the last company on this list is my favorite Indian coffee brand, Blue Tokai. And the really interesting thing about this company is that it's not just international in the fact that they sell coffee outside of India, but also the leadership of the company is international too. So Matcha Taranjan was expecting to spend one year in India starting in 2011 in the city of Chennai, where he got a job opportunity and also happened to be his dad's home city before moving back to the United States. But moving back to the United States never happened. Instead, Matt met his co-founder and wife, Namrata Astana, and they decided to follow their passion for coffee by bringing the third wave of coffee culture to India. And selling premium export grade Indian coffee to Indians in India had really never been done on a large scale before, but Matt and Namrata decided that they wanted to be the first ones to do it. In 2013, they went from an online only e-commerce model to an omni-channel model by opening their first Blue Tokai Coffee Roasters outlet in Delhi. And over the next decade, they've opened 60 physical outlets across the country, raised $46 million. And also they've expanded their presence overseas to Japan as well. In 2023, they raised a $30 million Series B round with the goal of expanding further into global markets and also proving to the rest of the world that India has some really exceptional coffee. Also, I recently had Matchitaranjan over for a podcast. It was an incredible conversation. Hearing his story about coming to India and building a business here as a foreigner is definitely worth a listen. So you can check his podcast out up here if you're interested, and I will see you in the next video.